This is a Farm Doc Daily webinar. I'm University of Illinois Extension Farm Broadcaster Todd Gleason. Thank you for joining us. This is our wrap up session of six. If you'd like to see all of them, you can do that on the Farm Doc Daily website anytime you'd like at farmdocdaily.illinois.edu. Look under webinars and then in the archive for IFAS online, you'll find all six of these sessions. Let's start the day with the idea that you're going to ask a lot of questions, or at least a few questions. I hope through the day you can do that uh, by putting those questions in the gray box over on the left-hand side of the page, down at the bottom where it says questions. We'll see them as soon as they pop up and take care of getting them answered. We'll start, though, with a summary of what each of our panelists discussed for the day. And I think I, I will go through some of the items that uh, Nick and Gary had thought about uh, uh, because I do have a written paragraph or two from them. They say the main messages from Gary's presentation was that 2023's income returns are projected uh, <clears throat> to relative to the last two years to be down, um, but that they had set the income, but of course we had set income records in 21 and 22. The projection, right Gary and Nick, for 23 is per acre returns back down to some of the better levels experienced from 2014 to 2020, uh, $60 to $80 an acre, which translates into about $80 to $100,000 of average farm income for the average sized farm in the FBFM. And I think that's probably for the grain farms, that's roughly 1,500 acres. So down, but still positive, the two of them, right? This is driven by the decline in commodity prices. Again, they say the, this is relatively uh, speaking uh, to very high levels for the past two years, which are still, historically high at this time, and we'll hear more about that too a bit later. Uh, although there are rising costs with fertilizer being the main story there. Looking forward, the two of them say overall costs will likely continue to rise through 23 and 24, and downside price risk becomes a bigger concern at current return projections. Um, risk management recommendations, not a bearish market prediction, they say, is to consider marketing more grain earlier to capture positive margins that's not new. They've been talking about it since August. Uh, however, they have upped that ante just a bit in the last couple of weeks, like most of the analysts that I happen to talk to on WILL radio have. Not, um, uh, and they have also not recommended to cut costs by backing off of crop insurance. That crop insurance decision, of course, is due on the 15th day of March. Now, Nick and Gary will both be at the All Day Ag Outlook, so you can come and see them in person March the 7th at the Beef House in Covington, Indiana. Small commercial here if you've not registered for that. Uh, Farmdocdaily.illinois.edu and right in the center of the page, you'll see All Day Ag Outlook. There are details there. We have all of the Farmdoc team uh, and a whole bunch of other folks that will be with us as well. I think Joe Jansen will turn to you next. Since we've done the budgets, uh, tell me a little bit about uh, your outlook as it's related uh, to the 2022, 23, uh, and 2023-24 20, crops. Yeah, I think there's a lot of echoes there. Obviously, the price of corn and soybeans is a big driver in sort of where those budgets come out. Um, and so in my IFAS presentation, we just talked about how we have gone through this period of you know, multiple years of relatively high prices in historic terms. We've really had tight supply and demand conditions in global corn and soybean markets since like the fall of 2020, we saw a tightening. We think back to that period where we had a surge in export demand for US corn and soybeans. Um, then we came into this, into this year, maybe we thought things might sort of back off a little bit and uh we you know had the, the war in ukraine starting in, in early 2022 and that really kind of revised everyone's expectations about you know what sort of the global supply and demand balance looked like in these markets and that kind of continues to echo into into today uh, i've got a piece coming out on farm doc daily tomorrow just about um sort of what's happened with our expectations about ukrainian corn and and wheat sort of uh supply both sort of on the production and export side. I think that'll be a big story um, going forward. The other one, and I think my colleague Joanna Calusi will talk about this in just a minute, is about sort of South American production situation. One, the extreme losses that we observed early in 2022 still sort of with us in terms of tightening the global supply and demand balance. And then going into 2023, you know, how big is the crop that will be harvested in South America and what will that do to, to market conditions? Um, 
In terms of sort of marketing decisions on the old crop side, uh, we talked about you know there being just sort of very limited incentive to to hold grain. Uh, we see very you know flat or negative carries in both the corn and soybean market right now, and that's kind of been the case for the last you know two to three months. We haven't seen that situation change much at all. Uh, so really kind of limited input impetus for sort of waiting to market that old crop 2022 production. That uh, I think there's you know, strong reason to think that that should be moved. Uh, on the new crop side, we really do have, it's important to remember, elevated price levels in historic terms. Uh, and so it, again, like Gary and Nick recommended, I think there's a, a strong case for looking to lock in some portion of that 2023 crop at favorable margins, especially when farmers are thinking about pricing inputs for the coming year. Uh, also thinking about pricing output and locking in uh, some kind of margin for uh, some part of the 2023 crop. Uh, the last thing I'll sort of talk maybe briefly about is how, you know, since we put together our IFAS presentations, both the ones we did uh, in person in early January and, then, and through this online series, uh, the market has really turned its eyes towards planted acreage in the U.S. Yes, uh, just this morning we had uh, USDA come out with its initial U.S. balance sheet projections and acreage projections for, for 2023. Um, not much of a surprise in those numbers. We might sort of talk through them a little bit more, uh, particularly in light of any questions that anyone has. Uh, corn acres may be slightly lower than you know, what USDA has sort of put as their long run baseline, but uh, right in line with expectations in the trade uh, of the number right now is 91 million acres, uh, planted acres for corn uh, in the US in 2023. On the soybean side, uh, kind of again, uh, not much of a difference between sort of analysts expectations and, and USDA planted acreage at 87 and a half million uh, acres of soybeans. That's exactly where we were in 2022. It's sort of kind of, a, again, a strong case for that, given what we see in terms of ratio of corn to soybean prices right now. Uh, so those are sort of the big factors kind of coming up and, and I think there's sort of, but again, a lot of uncertainty, especially related to the war uh, in Ukraine and then other sort of you know, geo, global geopolitical factors that kind of have the potential always to kind of cause major shifts in supply and demand. We'll follow along on this uh, and turn to Joanna Colusi now, who uh, presented about uh, production in South America, Brazil and Argentina, both of course a drought in Argentina and a frost this past weekend. We need to know some more about what we think the production looks like there and whether Brazil can compensate for those losses. Uh, can you recap uh, what production uh, looks like and what competition from South America might be for U.S. farmers in the coming years? Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, good morning, uh, Todd, uh, and thank you all you for joining us today and uh, it's great to be here again uh, so since your last webinar at the beginning of the february we have some important updates regarding the crop season in south america as you know it's harvest time in brazil and argentina uh, so the forecasts are updated weekly and uh, we have like you said completely different situations in brazil and argentina so i'm gonna start with brazil uh, the brazilian high is under way at this moment and it's expected to supply the market over the next few months around 23 percent of the soybean area was harvested by february 18 compared to with 33 percent a year ago uh, the delay was caused by constant rains in the region uh, and while there is a plant of rain in the center west there is a lack of rain in southern brazil it's especially in Rio Grande do Sul. But despite the losses in the south of Brazil, yield gains in the center west uh, should offset them. Uh, in Mato Grosso, the country's largest producing state, yields haven't been good so far, around 58, 59, until 60 acres per bushel on average. Uh, Brazil's soybeans crop is projected to at 5.6 billion bushels, uh, the largest on record, but just a little bit below previous expectations, uh, according to the data from the National Supply Company. This amount represents an increase of 22% compared to the last season. Uh, so, 
a quick uh, overview now about corn production in Brazil. The production is projected to reach almost 4.9 billion bushels. That's, that means a new record. Uh, that represents an increase of 10% compared to last season. Uh, and this amount refers to the total corn production, including first, second, and third crops in Brazil. Uh, right now, the first crop crop uh, the first corn crop, sorry, is being harvested in the south of Brazil. Meanwhile, the second corn crop, the safrinha, is being planted in the center west uh, right after the soybean harvest. Uh, currently, around 33% of the safrinha area was planted by February 18, compared with 46% a year ago. So as the soybean harvest is a little bit delay the safrinha planting uh, happened the same. There is a huge expectation around the safrinha crop in Brazil this year, uh, especially uh, this year when the country has a chance to surpass the United States as a major corn exporter. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, let's jump now, let's move uh, on to the crop prospects in Argentina. Uh, we can see a completely different situation there. Uh, the crops uh, have been hit by the worst drought the country has faced in the last 60 years. Uh, last week's high temperature complicated the state of soybeans and corn even more. But that's not all. Although it's summer in the southern hemisphere, some areas have experienced a, a drastic shift in the weather, going to a heat wave to a frost in less than one week. So that was really bad for the for the crops in Argentina. According to the Rosario Board of Trade, soybean production is projected to decrease around 20% in Argentina, reaching less than 1.3 billion bushels. Uh, the corn situation is very similar to soybeans. Argentina is projected to produce 1.6 billion bushels, a decrease of 17% from last year. It's important to remember that these expected reductions are under a year that was a red below the average. The last three years, uh, Argentina faced a uh, drought. Uh, and by the way, this forecast from uh, Rosario Board Trade uh, for soybeans and corn is from before the frosts. Uh, it's possible to have more production losses after that, which would make this season's harvest in Argentina one of the lowest in 15 years. Uh, so the situation is really there in Argentina. The confidence index of agriculture farmers measured by the egg barometer uh, from the Austral University in Rosario, uh, it's at the lowest level in, the his, in the, its history. The current financial situation of the producers is the worst of the entire series since uh, October 2018. Uh, around 70% of the farmers state that their financial situation is worse uh, than it was a few years ago. So just to finish, uh, we have been having a La Nina for three years in a row since 2020. La Nina usually creates a hotter and dry summer in Argentina and southern and Brazil and so far has been doing so. However, there is a forecast of a transition from La Nina to a neutral year starting now in February. So that could be a good news for Argentina uh, production. So I think that's uh, what I have for now. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have later. Indeed, if you've got questions, you can always write those in the box and Joanna and the rest of the crew will get them answered. Uh, Joanna, thank you for converting all of those things to bushels because I know they come in in metric tons, both from USDA and uh, uh, from the Rosario board and from CONAB in Argentina or in Brazil. Speaking of which, if you wanna see the supply and demand tables of uh, from CONAB. I tend to get those posted on the uh, willag.org website along with the USDA numbers, WILLAG.org in uh, US uh, uh, equivalent. So they're in bushels to the acre and it's the full supply and demand tables when they're released. Normally those come out monthly during the growing season. So they're 
um, about the same time the USDA numbers get updated as well. Let's turn our attention to Bruce Sherrick now. He's going to talk a little bit about farmland prices. He's the director of the TIAA Center for Farmland Research. You can always find that online as part of the U of I, of course, at farmland.illinois.edu. He's in Washington, D.C. today. Thank you, Bruce, for being with us. I know we don't have video from you, but I suppose we can hear you. Thanks. Yep. Good morning, everyone. And yes, I'm coming to you from the USDA's Outlook Forum. It's a very large meeting they have every year. Uh, Secretary Dag was on this morning giving his view of what was going on in the sector and the plans going forward. And it was a really interesting moment because the, the last couple of years in farmland markets as you would would understand, have been just uh, record setting. We had increases in farmland values in the middle of the country that in most cases were in the 30% range. Uh, we just finished, in fact, the collection of all data from the Illinois Society for last year's uh, sales as well. And we corroborate that no matter what source we look at with NACREF, with USDA data, with Illinois survey data. So it's just been an absolutely remarkable bull run in farmland values. And that's explained by, I'll put this into kind of a, uh, what I think is a sort of easy way to remember it, we can look at the eyes first, and the eyes are income, inflation, interest rates, and what happens internationally with the rest of the world, both demand and trade issues, not just our exports, but as Joanna was saying, the world is a large, complicated place with a lot of uh, flows, and uh, it's been fairly positive, though, for prices. Uh, prices then reflect themselves in incomes to some degree but also outward looking forward prospects for income are fairly high. We've heard a lot about increasing input costs, another I perhaps, uh, but the uh, increases to the uh, revenue side have kept up or exceeded that. And that's why we've had a couple of years of fantastic income. Uh, prior to that, the farm sector was the recipient of a lot of transfer payments, both through uh, you know, a few years ago, the market facilitation payments, but then through COVID as well, a lot of transfer payments landed in the balance sheet of agricultural uh, producers and owners. So farmland values went up. At the conference today, I would say that the themes though are all uh, the C's. We, we are looking at crop insurance and commodity prices and, and carbon and climate effects and the climate smart uh, uh, proposals coming out of uh, Congress. And, and Jonathan will be able to speak to this more directly, but the emphasis of farm policy has definitely uh, had a different um, filter or focus, and that likewise has had a fairly positive impact on farmland because agriculture is now, I think, to a large extent, viewed as part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Uh, at the IFAS presentations and online and kind of as a, a continuing theme of research and support for this kind of information, uh, we did go at the meetings through how land prices have responded around the country as well and why this particular episode has been especially favorable for the middle of the country that grows corn and soybeans primarily. And the coast have in California, Pacific Northwest, uh, Texas, the Panhandle, the uh, Northern Plains have likewise had positive increases, but not quite as much as you would have experienced in the middle of the country. Uh, again, it's, it's pretty explainable when you take the parts apart. I uh, wanna talk about a couple of them specifically. The first being interest rates, <clears throat> excuse me. We've, we've had kind of a, an obvious response by the Fed uh, through the recent um, unprecedented in speed, at least number of rate hikes to try to uh, choke out inflation and get a handle on the economy growing really quickly. Well, some of those translate to increased costs for farmers, but not as much as maybe the, you know, the common headline math might suggest. Think about an operating loan say $400 an acre operating loan, uh, half the cost of putting in corn roughly, or the, of the variable cost for six months. If interest rates went up 200 basis points, the total change in interest expense is still only about a bushel of corn. So on the operating side, it's not that big of a deal, but more importantly, on the long-term side, uh, the sector is going to cross $4 trillion in total value this year. More than 85% of that is farmland. And of that, only 13.9% or so is represented as leverage. And so the farmers who have debt already, not all of it is variable rate. So a change in interest rate kind of locks you into the existing loan that you had if it was originated in the last few years. That turns out to actually be more valuable, not less valuable when rates go up. 
the value of your old fixed rate debt means it's not as expensive for you to pay it off again. Uh, so it's a little bit of a flip in perspective on the interest rate relationship. Inflation, well, input costs have definitely gone up. Inflation generally is a destabilizing effect as well. But the definition of inflation is the nominal change in widely consumed commodities and goods. And farmland happens to produce widely consumed commodities and goods. And so what we tend to see is after long periods of sustained inflation, fairly sticky increases in prices as well. Again, at a constant production, I would expect that the total value of, of corn and soybeans, for example, would actually have a positive impact from inflation. Uh, and that's that's borne itself out. We've generated some, I think, fairly fascinating um, uh, results and graphics that go all the way back to the 1960s and and compare farmland total return to the impact of inflation and what we discover, not new, what, what is evident and continuing, I should say, is that farmland has a very positive correlation with inflation and the positive margin of total return for agriculture is more stable and higher than almost any other asset class. That, of course, has led to institutional interest in the asset class and how does one uh, make those uh, acquisitions. And the impact of higher interest rates for the institutional buyers is a bit reversed. That's a little harder than a neighbor with cash when you have to use leverage to purchase something when interest rates go up. I didn't say that in a very articulate way, but the, the interest impact for levered buyers is, of course, much greater than for a cash buyer. Uh, earlier in the week, I was at a meeting of the Farmland Capital Alliance, which is a collection of, um, I would say, large uh, interest in agricultural um, activities as well, many of them focused on ownership of land. And there was, I would say, guarded optimism of continued high performance as an asset class. I think most people think that the, you know, double digit uh, appreciation period is probably in our rear view mirror now, but not making many um, uh, kind of judgments or predictions that it's going to have a major reversal. Um, kind of thinking through a few other issues, if you look at crop insurance, one of the things that perhaps has been a little bit underplayed this year is the massive reduction in volatility factor that will make crop insurance much more affordable per dollar of coverage for the major Midwest crops. Not necessarily the same for everything, but uh, corn, if we were making our project projections today, the projected price will be just under six bucks, 5.95, volatility down to 18. And that compares incredibly favorably with the last few years, both on the amount of coverage you can get and on the price it will cost. Soybeans, about 13.80 would be my best prediction right now and volatility that's teetering between 13 and 14. That's again incredibly low. Last year it was 19, 2021 it was 19 volatility. You have to go back to 2018, 2019, and 2020 to see that low of volatility again. Um, <clears throat> going forward, I think one of the other things that there's a lot of attention and I, attention being paid to, I don't know exactly how this is going to work itself out, but we have yeah. Um, direct spending through things like the Inflation Reduction Act that will generate pressure to increase renewable energy installations over farmland. Uh, it's easy to uh, kind of say, well, why don't we just put the uh, solar and the wind in places where there aren't as many people or not as good a farmland, but a couple of really good studies have been kind of making their way out and around. And the problem with that is it's very expensive to transport electricity a very long period of long space. And so you kind of have to balance the uh, location of generation where you have good wind, you have good solar resources with the areas of consumption, namely where people live. Uh, what we have done, and this, this was first brought up by Dave Muth out in Iowa, kind of put together a Iowa has a really highly uh, developed and, and fairly deeply installed wind generation capacity, so you can kind of get a sense of what it costs to put up a new tower a little more accurately there. But if you were to just say of the new wind that we expect to be installed and the new solar to hit any of the targets in the IRA or the targets of net zero, about 80% of that would actually end up over top of farmland. If you just take the revenue streams from that and apply normal like, you know, think of cash rent for corn or cash rent for solar or cash rent for wind and think about the effect of this 
potentially large investment in renewables, that can add another half a trillion dollars to the value of farmland uh, over the next uh, 10 to 15 years. Now, that's a, that's a really big number. That's a really, really big number. Uh, again, the sector being worth about $4 trillion, having another half a trillion, um, you know, one-eighth of that or 12.5% is a, a reasonably important thing to pay attention to going forward. Again, not making a predict prediction on that, not forecasting a specific path to that outcome, but would say that the emphasis, you know, it's, again, spending almost the entire week in D.C. this week, um, about all I hear is uh, conversations related to how we're going to move forward with conservation, how we're going to move forward with climate mitigation strategies, climate smart uh, production systems, how crop insurance may or may not get tied to conservation, what's going to keep commodity prices higher, and then after we emerge from our uh, kind of period of inflation, what all that means. And I think um, uh, I think we're going to end up going to Jonathan next, and we we like to. Uh, lean on our local policy expert a lot, but I, I am fond of a statement one of our other colleagues made once that was kind of profound. It said there's nothing as permanent as a temporary government program. I think the emphasis on these programs is just simply not going to go away. I think crop insurance is a, a permanent and increasingly high coverage, low shallow loss kind of instrument. I think the attention to the environment through policies implemented or at least fostered by government are not going away. And I, I have a personal um, kind of assessment of what the long-term demand growth will be for calories based on increasing standards of living around the world. And I have a, a fairly uh, positive view of the long-term price of commodities as well. All of that adds up for me to say, I think farmland markets are doing exactly what they're supposed to do, aggregate a large number of highly informed opinions and attract uh, rent and return seeking capital into it at the right price. And we got to the levels we're at today because of that. Uh, Todd, that's what I have. Um, and again, I think it's probably a good, good segue over to Jonathan as well. I presume he'll be next. He is next. In fact, uh, we'll take a moment here to remind folks if they have questions, and they probably do now for sure, uh, about uh, farmland or other things you've heard about or anything else related to agriculture. You can put them in the boxes, uh, the, gray, the gray boxes over probably on the left-hand side of the page or down at the bottom of the page. Uh, a reminder, too, that our sponsors for uh, this event and a lot of the farm doc events include the TIA Center for Farmland Research, Compare Financial, Corteva AgriScience, Farm Credit Illinois, the Illinois Soybean Association, FS Growmark, and the Illinois Corn Growers Association. I do not believe that I could have done a better setup, Jonathan Coppas, for the importance of policy that's structured out of uh, the federal government than Bruce has done, uh, including how the Inflation Reduction Act might uh, move uh, the marketplace for land for years to come. Uh, you've been thinking about this a lot and some about how it will impact the 2023 Farm Bill. What did you present during the IFAS online series? Yeah, now since, since Bruce did, did such a good job, I guess I'm going to owe him. So thanks for thanks for adding to that debt. And uh, I got to appreciate, you know, Joanna said it and others said it, you know, we really appreciate everybody um, joining and, and kind of, you know, learning through uh, some new things with us uh, as we work through uh, you know, doing this online uh, and adding and building out further from what we are able to do in person. Um, I appreciate the fact that uh, having long expected to break a camera whenever I'm on it, that I managed to do it today. And so apparently uh, <laughs> the shirt I wore was not appropriate for the camera. So thanks for uh, suffering through that with us. So with, 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 you know, with that as an intro, let's, let's talk a little bit of Farm Bill. And during the, during the live meetings and the, and the presentation we did online, we sort of set up this roadmap, uh, the things we we're going to watch and sort of work. Uh, watch work through as we tried to map out what a farm bill looked like. And we've got through some key ones so far. Um, obviously, the committees have been formed up. And so uh, we've got a couple articles out there looking at the House and Senate agriculture committees and how uh, some various, you know, measures and information about those, where where some of the priorities may sit or how we can maybe analyze some of the priorities for the committees. And what we expect to be a very challenging farm bill process, um, it is a split Congress and both chambers have very tight majorities. And, and, and so the vote margins are thin and working those, those out with, uh, you know, 
with very few votes to spare, uh, it gets to be challenging in, in managing the coalitions in the process. So we looked at those things, but we've got our committees in place. They've started to do work. Obviously, if you uh, follow this, you've seen some hearings, quite a few hearings, actually. They've, they've uh, gotten started quickly. Uh, and doing that, that sort of uh, groundwork that we, we would expect them to do, uh, pulling in witnesses and getting a sense of and, and getting uh, you know, updates on how programs have operated since the last Farm Bill. And then the other big thing that came out last week, and, uh, and if you uh, follow the Farm Doc Daily articles, um, I did a first article on it here t that was released this morning, which is the Congressional Budget Office. Um, so every year they release this uh, this baseline projection of 10 years of spending. And it's this baseline that they just released last week that will dictate or control what the committees have to work with in this farm bill process. And so um, we walk through uh, the major spending areas we're looking at. Uh, and, and again, we always got to remember the baseline is a 10 year projection. So they're going to look at the farm bill as it exists today and assume that nothing changes for the next 10 years. And they're going to run their spending analysis around that everything from price and yield expectations to economic factors and uh, for poverty rates around uh, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. You know, the top line number there is, uh, is it's about $140 billion a year bill right now, which is roughly 1.4 trillion over 10. Those sound like big numbers and they are, uh, but they're also, there's a lot of context that goes around that. Um, so certainly, uh, you know, increased spending on the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, so more people in the program as the economy continues to improve. Um, but we see inflationary pressures around prices and uh, food prices uh, because that program helps individuals buy food. Um, again, it's it's set at, at you know below 130 percent of the poverty level. Um, so we, we've seen increased spending in that uh, in that program. You know, it's it's tougher. Uh, to to think out 10 years so we look at the 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 nearer term years on on some of these to see kind of really what what may be going on um certainly see some 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 of the higher uh, price increase or the spending increases in the short term title one programs again we the the uh, agriculture risk coverage program a price loss coverage program uh with the higher prices as joe was mentioning and 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 that's certainly feeding into the baseline, at least in the next couple of years. And so we've seen the Title I spending uh, drop off a little bit in the, in the near term, but kind of, uh, hate to say rebound, but certainly increases in the, in the later years of that, of that CBO estimate. Conservation, uh, we're looking at pretty steady state, with the exception of this Inflation Reduction Act, which Bruce mentioned a few times, which was uh, enacted back in September. And it doesn't change the baseline, but CBO provided some very helpful information to understand how they expect that program or that amount of funding to be spent out of the programs. And this is always gets confusing and kind of, you know, wrapped around some of the internal or inside baseball um, mechanisms. But we have the Title II uh, programs, things like the Environmental Quality Incentives Programs, that cost share assistance for farmers to do practices. Uh, the Conservation Reserve Program, the Conservation Stewardship Program, a five-year contract for practices. Those are all funded uh, through what we call mandatory spending with the Commodity Credit Corporation. Uh, and so that's where the baseline runs. The baseline runs on that mandatory funding for those programs. And then the Inflation Reduction Act added a multi-year appropriation to many of the same programs, so EQIP, CSP, the Agriculture Easement Program, and the Regional Conservation Program but it doesn't change the baseline. And so this is gonna be one of those political things. I know it sounds like we're, you know, we got a lot of weird things moving around in the, in the CBO estimates, but the key aspect about this is it kind of sets up this perception that there's additional funding that can just be used out of that Inflation Reduction Act. And obviously that is not as easy uh, as it may sound up front. Uh, there's certainly gonna be a lot of politics around that. There's gonna be a lot of challenges in how the Congressional Budget Office estimates that spending. So for example, uh, Congress appropriated in the Inflation Reduction Act about 18 plus billion dollars for those conservation programs over multiple years that could be spent through 2031. But the Congressional Budget Office estimates about 15 billion of that that would be spent. And so we've got some some of those interplays in how the programs and, and spending work. So we'll be watching closely how the committees uh, begin to look at that and evaluate uh, the spending and the operation of those programs. As Bruce mentioned, they, the Inflation Reduction Act was focused on a subset of practices uh, to help farmers adopt um, practices and conservation efforts on their farms and system changes to help uh, reduce emissions, reduce uh, nutrient losses, and improve soil carbon capture and storage and a few things like that. Um, so we've seen, uh, we've, we've got that big 
component uh, in the in the baseline and in the farm bill discussions. Crop insurance um, pretty much holding steady. It's it's it, it's got a higher uh, expected set of outlays or spending in the CBO baseline. Probably built around higher prices and a more expensive or more valuable crop being insured. Um, but it didn't look to have changed, you know, a whole lot from what we've seen. And it's running at about 97 billion over a 10 year a 10 year spend uh, estimate. And that's, so that's our next piece. And so we're gonna watch the committees as they hold these hearings and really begin this negotiation process and hopefully writing a farm bill. Uh, but of course, if you, if you sat through uh, the discussions uh, back in January, we're, we're running around the state or in the webinar, the big unknown for this farm bill, uh, I mean, a big unknown for much more than this farm bill, but the biggest unknown for this farm bill process is the debt ceiling uh, scenario. Um, and as we talked about in the past, and as many of you have probably read or have heard about, you know, this is uh, a negotiation issue uh, between the new uh, Republican majority in the House, uh, the Democratic majority in the Senate, and President Biden. And there's a statutory debt limit that only permits the uh, the Treasury to borrow up to so much amount, up to so much uh, to pay the obligations that have already been incurred by the federal government. Uh, so that amount was 31.4 trillion. It was last raised in the previous uh, administration and has been raised multiple times over the years to get the 31.4 trillion. Um, it, uh, we officially hit the debt ceiling back in mid-January and the treasury department's now trying to manage uh, revenues and spending to try to keep us from going into what would be a uh, catastrophic default on the federal debt. And so we don't have a good sense of where these negotiations are going right now uh the house has demanded spending cuts um uh president biden has has refused to negotiate spending cuts around the debt ceiling um obviously if you watch the state of the union there's quite a bit of controversy about what might be on the chopping block things like social security or medicare or not uh and how that all plays out and so it's kind of one of those big moving factors in the political space that would really, or potentially could really disrupt or impact how a farm bill gets written. So we don't have many more answers on that, um, but we will be watching it and trying to understand what it may mean. Uh, with that, I've probably exhausted my, uh, my intro time. So uh, Todd, back to you. And I believe, uh, are we at question time now? We are at question and answer time, and I think uh, a couple of things. Uh, I told you, I believe, Jonathan, that I borrowed from the IFAS online had to produce the last Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction podcast. Uh, some of what you put there is in that, along with Ivan Dozier, explains what the IRA, he was the, was the retired, just retired head of the Illinois Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, in one place. It's at willag.org under podcast. Look for the Nutrient Loss Reduction Podcast. And I'll use that on Tuesday, the 7th day of March, because we'll all be kind of busy at the All Day Ag Outlook. Uh, people can sign up. Again, willag.org will use uh, that podcast as the closing market report on that day. Nick Polson says he's moved, uh, and we may have some better audio from him. Nick, I'm going to take a chance and think that that's probably the case. We do have a question uh, for you. It's about fertilizer prices. They've, of course, come down for corn and, uh, and corn and soybean prices have come up since you put your budgets together in December. Uh, won't that improve the return and income outlook for 2023? Yeah, I think... Uh... I think definitely on the on the commodity price side, the increase will improve it maybe from what we put out in December. Um, we got a lot of questions, probably more so on the, the fact that fertilizer prices have continued to come down and, and won't that also improve uh, kind of where we're looking at returns and in income for 2023. Um, I think the challenge on the fertilizer side is, you know, most farmers probably have at least a portion, maybe a significant portion of their fertilizer already booked and paid for for the year, maybe put it on in the fall as anhydrous, um, and even some of the, the spring applications upcoming are, are, are maybe already priced. And so uh, maybe not as much of an opportunity there to, to capture those lower prices from 2023, but definitely you know, any portion that was still unpriced would, would, um, would tend to improve some of those numbers that we had back in December. Um, you know, so I think we were looking at about an $80,000 average farm income for that typical 1,500-acre corn and soybean operation in, in central Illinois. Um, probably looking at, you know, 100 to 110 maybe 
uh, thousand uh, in terms of that effect there, and probably be at the upper end of that return range that you had that you had discussed earlier. So probably in that, that eighty, maybe eighty to ninety dollar return based on on some of those positive movements on prices and, and lower costs. We're looking at now too. We have a series of other questions, and I'm hoping, I believe that Scott Irwin is with us. And Scott, if maybe you can turn your camera on or at least turn your mic on so I know whether you're able to and, and wanting to answer a question or not. We'll, we'll see. But Joe, uh, I'll turn to you very quickly. Uh, because the major crops are crowding up against that 350 million acres that we've had in the past in total, uh, somebody wants to know with the elevated prices of the last two years, why are we still, uh, it, they haven't crowded up there yet, just just yet. Why is it that we're still only down at 320 million acres? Yeah, it is, I think both Scott and I would say a, a bit of a mystery in terms of why we haven't seen larger acreage response in the United States. You would think, you know, three years of, of elevated corn and soybean prices would be, um, you know, significant incentive. It's, it's, it's stronger incentive than just about anything. I mean, any policy incentive we could think of it, this is a stronger incentive to, at least in the short run, uh, expand expand production. Um, and we really haven't seen it. And USDA's numbers that came out today in terms of planted acreage for 2023 would suggest we won't see it, especially in, in the next year either. Maybe a little bit of a uh, an acreage response on the corn side if it's slightly higher corn acreage than we saw a year ago. Uh, but really, uh, it's pretty muted given the, given the high prices that we're seeing right now. And, and I think it is a bit of a mystery. Now, we, we can talk about all these sort of competing things that are sort of you know, uh, competing with corn and soybeans for, for, for space on our, in, our, in America's farmland. Uh, people will talk about things like renewable energy. Um, but it, it seems like there's a, it's, it's a lot of things. It's not one thing that's sort of crowding out the, the for, for higher, uh, higher crop production. Well, I, I want to ask about cons conservation reserve programs or conservation and how that works into that 320 million. Um, I know it doesn't, but I mean, how does it flex the 320 million? And will that be something that ha has to play a, a greater role in the future because of the push to mitigate the changing climate? That we would, uh, sort of just to clarify, Todd, that you're saying, you know, that part of the, the climate response is, is acreage reduction like we see with the Conservation Reserve Program? Correct. Um, that's a, I think that's a good question. I think it's sort of important to understand like what's the composition of those acres? Uh, there's, I think like a core set of acres that are in that program that you know, probably like aren't super responsive to the, you know, just because they're not super suitable for, for major, uh, major crop production. Um, but, um, yeah, in terms of, is that, I think probably it seems like from my perception of the policy process, and Jonathan, I think you should chime in on here on this too, uh, that more of what we want, uh, more of sort of what we're working towards is something to do with working lands, to do with sort of uh, improving uh, climate related outcomes on land that's in production, just because it is the larger, uh, a significantly larger share of, of what agriculture is. Anything yeah, to follow I, up with, Jonathan? No, I have nothing to argue with Joe about on that. I mean, I think, um, you know, the CRP is running, what, about 22 million acres? So it's not a, it's not a huge, uh, overwhelming amount of acreage in it. I think the cap right now, I think we're about 5 million below the cap. I think it's around 27 million. You know, but part of the challenge, I think, Todd, with one of the things you asked about is it's a 10-year contract. So that acres, they are locked away over, you know, what may be a lot of changes and pressures um, with market volatility and so forth. Um, and I agree with Joe, too. I think, and you see that in the Inflation Reduction Act, it was not, uh, it did not provide additional funding for CRP. It really focused on working lands, with the exception of the easement programs. And you can think of, you know, a wetlands easement still allows most of the field to, uh, to be in production. And, and that's where a lot of this climate focus is, is on how to, uh, and, and Bruce mentioned the Climate Smart Commodities uh, pilot effort that USDA uh, did really trying to innovate in that space and push it into, you know, the, the uh, aligned with commodity production and not a competing land use, if you will, or not, not necessarily taking land out of production for it. Um, uh, so I, I think that's, that, that's, you know, going to continue. And I think it's going to continue to be a, a real interest 
Uh, we have questions about solar and wind development on this. Bruce wants to try to take that and, um, uh, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, is there concern about using productive row crop farmland uh, removed from production um, for solar and wind? And how does that kind of play in? I don't know, Bruce, are you still on? Do you want to? Sure. Yeah. Press yeah I mean, it's, it's a really common uh, entry point into the conversation. And uh, I may have shared with a, f a few of my colleagues a question that I got from an actual landowner who was debating whether or not to take a thousand dollar an acre lease guaranteed for 20 years for a solar installation. And, and you know, the question is a little dumbfounding to me, like what would be the downside on that with solar where it was really pretty easily put in and taken out. The location of it though has to be where there's a place to connect to the grid or the interconnects have to be uh, convenient. Um, and so if you take a thousand acres out of production to put solar on, the questions of what then happens to the remaining acres in terms of their value, uh, generally, generally, at least we know directionally that that would be a policy for remaining acres. So if you were to add another source of income to agriculture, rearrange the number of acres that were producing something and they went down, the remaining acres are worth more. In the same way that water reallocation in California, the acres with uh, two sources of water are worth even more now because of lower amounts of water and so on. Um, but the, again, there are a couple of uh, pretty good, I think, agreed upon now uh, uh, documentation of where it costs the least to put in renewable or green energy uh, installations. And they do line up pretty much with a big part of the production region in the country. They kind of get a little further west and they follow the Mississippi Delta a little bit more. And then the second thing you can do is to say if we were to change tillage practices, how much uh, carbon could we sequester and what would be the needed market price of carbon to attract al alternative practice behavior on land as well. And that's part of the same set of conversations. So you can't, you can't really just look at installation one without considering the option for for uh, continuing in production with other payments that would be related to or offset the energy question. Um, wind is a little more complicated in my mind. Uh, the place that you should locate wind includes near populations as well, but it turns out that people on the coast don't like great big windmills three miles offshore in interrupting your view of the horizon on the ocean either. And so um, it's complicated to put things in that are hard to take out. Uh, a lot of the wind installation, again, I was ahead of Illinois a bit, and that section of good quality wind, I know that sounds like a funny thing to say if you're like me and hate being out in the wind, but high quality stable wind where it's a fairly constant speed at a certain elevation is a pretty positive thing. Uh, I think has a long-term positive impact on the value of the assets in the sector. In terms of <coughs> food security or quantity of food production, uh, so far, it's it's still rather uh, de minimis. It doesn't have, we're not looking at hundreds of millions of acres kind of thing that just disappear from production. It's not, it's not going to begin competing at a major level. Um, uh, and quite often, we are able to do things like around a wind tower where the, the pad and the road in actually becomes a good loading and unloading zone for the grain carts. Or you don't take that much out of production when you put that in. Are institutional investors more interested, uh, relatively speaking, in places where they can put in or are able to purchase potentially an existing solar farm or wind towers than they are in agricultural only um, products? I think that that's a very good question and it's actually got an unfortunately very complicated answer. <laughs> that farmers tend to use a higher discount rate on income from wind generation and solar than an institutional buyer, but an institutional buyer doesn't have or you know, has been very careful about um, you know, not overbidding. They're pretty careful acquirers. Um, the uh, ability to therefore separate who owns what class of land, you know, land that would be suitable for wind and solar, would you expect somebody with a higher or lower discount rate to be able to afford it? That's, that's legitimate. Um, but all the other offsets to that make it a little more complicated. Institutional buyers are, are essentially more likely to have to report additional information about the production systems. And um, institutionals, for example, have been the, the fastest and largest um, adopters of things like leading harvest standards, which are you know reporting systems on the 
production systems and the impact on environment and so on. And wind doesn't always um, endear people <laughs> to the, uh, um, uh, both the buyer and the location, but it's a complicated fight to have in some places and school districts might like the revenue, but neighbors don't like the shadowing. And, and so I, I think it's just one of those really complicated economic questions still. Um, we do see, and we have for several years now, asked questions on the Illinois survey and have uh, found that, again, people will pay less for future income from wind than they'll pay for future income from growing corn. Uh, you know, a dollar in the future from wind isn't worth as much as a dollar in the future from growing corn. Uh, so there is some implied additional risk. Uh, the decommissioning questions are also not very well. Uh, we, we think we have the legal side of that all figured out, but we haven't gone in and taken out 500 wind towers yet. We haven't gone in and taken out a 300-acre solar installation and found out what it does to, to the, the area underneath and so on. Does it so again, matter? That was just a ramble, not an answer, but I think it highlights how complicated the question is and, and how complicated the answer is, too. Mm -hmm. Does it matter very much whether it's an absentee landowner or a farmer landowner? I think it would because it appears that uh, an absentee landowner could triple their income potentially uh, from a solar farm as to opposed to even a 50-50 lease. Well, I, I, I think all of the... I, I think you can always separate the questions into the owner and the operator, and sometimes it's the same person and sometimes it's not. In Illinois, about 60% of the land is rented, of course. And, and so, but I think that divide is not as great as sometimes it's made out to be because what's in the uh, best interest of the, the farmer's income, there's only so much income you can generate on that uh, square eight, that's, that land surface has to be split somehow between the the factors of production and the landowner uh, wants that number to be as big as possible and the operator wants their share of that biggest number to be as big as possible. So I think that they're actually more consistent in most cases than might be thought of. But if your point is, you know, not in my backyard kinds of responses are greater if you're both the operator and the owner, I think that's absolutely true. We've got about five minutes left. We'll go over if we need to. And so we're going to write, try to run through some questions really quickly. Uh, Joanna, will Brazil's export terminals be able to handle the crop that they're producing this year because it's such a big one? Yeah, actually, that's a big challenge for Brazilian agriculture. Uh, I would say that greater risk will be in the second half of the year, which uh, like a dispute between corn and sugar. Uh, although sugar exports are more regular, there is a, a peak in July and August, uh, the right time when the safrinha will begin to flow in Brazil. Uh, so according to a study by the University of Sao Paulo, on average, a 10% increase in exports volume generates a 5% increase in delays at the port of Santos, for example, in Sao Paulo, in addition to increasing the volume of traffic on toll roads to the port by 1%. So this can generate uh, lines of trucks uh, and increase freight prices uh, in Brazil. However, this scenario can be avoided because there is room for transporting grains via other logistical corridors in Brazil. The ports in the north of Brazil are transportation on average 3.3 million tons per month uh, and the maximum volume was observed in March 2022 with more than 5 million tons. Uh, anyway, almost 50% of Brazilian grain today is already exported via ports in the north uh, and around 55% in the ports uh, in the southeast of Brazil. So, but definitely it's one topic that we need to follow. Jonathan, I know that you're looking at the questions there on, and you may have one for yourself or somebody else, but I do have a question for you. Um, is the Farm Bill Coalition at risk due to the current makeup of Congress? You've talked uh, in the past about the last two Farm Bills not actually passing on the first round, which was highly unusual. Uh, it's made up of two sides, really, uh, the food and feeding programs and the ag programs. If, those, if that coalition fails, or is it likely to fail this time around? I mean, it's only at risk, honestly, if, if we see a repeat of the last two go-arounds, which would be a very partisan-focused attack on the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program and food assistance through that. 
Uh, if we go through that again, then I think, you know, third time around, uh, it does put the coalition at risk. If, however, uh, everybody comes together and tries to work this through in a much more normal process, then I think you can actually rebuild and, and maybe even strengthen that coalition. Um, but again, a lot, a lot's going to depend on what flows out of this budget uh, debt ceiling fight. We'll try to get to the rest of the questions here. We have come uh, close to the top of the hour. I, anything new in the Farm Bill for beginning farmers? Yeah, actually, there's quite a few provisions. There's not like a specific beginning farmers uh, title or program, but there's quite a few beginning farmers components within it. And we've actually seen those increase over time. So a couple examples, you know, there's funding available to help beginning farmers. There are the farm loan programs and ownership and operating loans through the Farm Service Agency that are kind of a first opportunity uh, for new farmers. And then uh, in recent years, we've tried to do things in crop insurance as well uh, to help new farmers transition into that farm or pull in, uh, you know, uh, APH, uh, annual production history, actual production history, sorry, um, yield numbers into that. So they're not at a disadvantage because they're, they're a new farm. So being able to carry some of that forward. Um, so there's usually quite a bit of interest in trying to help new farmers. And I think that will continue uh, and probably uh, even increase um, as we see some of the challenges facing. Um, farmers and the farming sector. And Joanna, one final question I'll uh, have for you. If USDA estimates come to fruition, Brazil will be the number one corn exporter uh, on the world stage this year. What are the main factors leading to that? Yeah, I know you have just one minute left, but I'm trying to summarize. Uh, I would say that there are three main reasons to support this projection. A new uh, and huge buyer in Brazil, China, forecast for yet another record break corn harvest, uh, especially Sarfinia, and some issues involving major uh, players in the global corn market, uh, like uh, you mentioned, Ukraine, um, Argentina also. Uh, so Brazil uh, and China reached a deal of phytosanitary requirement for corn last spring, and the first load of Brazilian corn was shipped to China in November. Uh, for example, in 2022, when Brazil hit a record uh, of corn exports, the primary destinations were Iran, Spain, Japan, Egypt, Colombia, and South America. In January, China became the first destination for Brazilian corn. So the pace of corn exports in January exceeds the ex expectations. Analysts expect Brazil could sell from 6 to 10 million tons of corn to China this year. So that way Brazil can e uh, easily reach uh, a total export of 50 million tons and so surpass the United States. It's important to remember that before the China-Brazil deal was finalized last year, China's main options for corn uh, imports war of course the united states uh ukraine and argentina now argentina is short of corn because of the drought there ukraine has become very unstable with the russia invasion and the corn prices uh in the united states are rising so the dollar is very strong uh, last year um uh, we had problems with uh, mississippi river so these all factors can lead brazil to become the top global corn exports this year. Thank you, Joanna. Joanna uh, Colusi, of course, along with Jonathan Coppa, Scott Irwin, who we didn't talk to, but we did see for just a bit, Joe Jansen, Nick Paulson, and Bruce Sherrick all joined us uh, for this final IFAS online series. It's a part of six uh, programs. You can find them all archived on the FarmDoc Daily website at farmdocdaily.illinois.edu. Under webinars and look in the archive, our educational partners include the FBFM, the Illinois Farm Business Farm Management folks, U of I Extension, and of course, the Department of Agricultural and Consumer Economics. Gary Schnitke was not here today. However, he will return next week. If you watched his program last Thursday morning, you're already signed up. If not, you can still sign up on that Farm Doc Daily website for the Crop Risk Management for 2023 program. And that is at 9 a.m. next Thursday, uh, March the 2nd. And then all the folks, uh, including Gary, will join me at the Beef House on Tuesday, the 7th day of March. 
uh, for the All Day Ag Outlook, along with a group of analysts for that you might hear with me on WILL AM 580. There'll be 10 of them. And uh, Mark Cheney from John Deere. If you'd like to join us, the cost is just $30. Sign up at uh, farmdocdaily.illinois.edu or willag.org. On behalf of Jim Baltz, who's behind the scenes, thank you for being with us today. I'm Todd Gleason.